Uh, Christoph Mallet. Hi, Hi, Chris. Is it Christoph? Hey, Samantha, how are you? Nice Christoph, to meet yeah, that's you. perfect. Christoph, great. Christoph is CEO and co-founder of Body Swaps and a guest lecturer on ARVR at Korea Geneva. He was um, a digital strategy consultant for a decade and had an award-winning VR studio called Somewhere Else. He was born in Paris, I'm very jealous, and he co-founded Body Swaps with a mission to unlock human potential in the workplace. So Body Swaps uses VR and AI and it's an award-winning soft skills training platform that empowers learners to practice new ways of thinking and acting within organizations and institutions. He also speaks internationally and is a regular podcaster. So welcome, Christoph. Thanks, Amanda, and uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon for those in, in Europe. Good morning for the one guy in California who I saw in the chat. Um, I was born in Paris, as you can hear from my accent, but I'm now in my living room in, uh, in London. Um, before I start to echo um, the, two, the two previous presentations, one thing is for people who haven't ever tried a VR headset, everything that was said so far must seem absolutely crazy, but it's the case. So you just have to put a headset on. There's no, um, no, no other way around it. The second point is maybe around the diversity of VR users. So this is not about what is the right use of VR, but whether what are the different ways in which you can use VR. And I think uh, what Dr. Isaacson showed is doing coaching in VR. What I'm going to talk about is bringing VR into coaching. And I guess you understand uh, what I mean by that. Um, I come from a business school background. Um, and at that school, I learned a lot about management. But I learned very little about being managed or being a manager. And I remember at the end of my first internship, all suited up in a skyscraper, you know, for a big consultancy. I was told that I could get the job, the full-time job, but I shouldn't hope to go far in my consultancy career because of my stutter, uh, which hurt a lot. And I hope back then that I had been trained for that kind of difficult conversation. I wished as well that that manager had been trained. And so the question for today is, what can VR do to help train for those conversations? What's the, what's the special power of virtual reality? So I wanted to start by talking about a couple of experiences. The first one, back from 2013 by Mel Slater, is quite fun. And they put 36 white males in a VR simulation in which they were playing jumping, uh, accompanying a virtual character. Group A just saw plain white hands, no body. Group B saw themselves in a mirror as a black man in a casual outfit and groups who saw themselves as a white man in a suit. What they measured is how much people moved depending on how they saw themselves. And so what they found is when people saw themselves as black, they engaged more with the simulation, they moved more. That's called the Proteus effect. There's a lot of research, but that one's part of the fun. It means people very quickly adopt in virtual reality the characteristics that they attach with the body they inhabit. So Dr. Isaacson mentioned the example of the forest and people jumping, uh, jumping out of trees at a metaphor that would not have happened in a, in a corporate environment. This is the equivalent, but for the body that you have. So that's all fun and games. But in 2018, Natalie Salmanovitz, uh, Stanford University, put people in a, in a VR experience where they were either black or white. And they had to just play with a uh, you know, paintbrush and little blocks of wood. It was completely innocuous. But a couple of weeks after that experience, everyone got given mock legal scenarios in which the defendant was either white or black and in which the level of evidence against the defendant was either very light or very strong. What they found is the people who embodied a black person were a lot less likely to give a guilty verdict even though that's completely uncorrelated to the experience itself. And so the power of virtual reality goes beyond the fact that it's immersive and engaging and increases the memories. There is some very deep subconscious behavioral transformation that is happening. So how do we bring that discovery into the realm of learning? What we did as Body Swaps three years ago when we started the company is we work with learning designers and behavioral scientists, and we asked that question, you know, how can we bring the new affordances of VR and what we know from how human beings learn into a new way to accelerate behavioral transformation? 
So when you learn emotional effect is great for memorability, this is reinforced in VR through embodiment. You're not watching the character, you are the character. It's an experience that's happening to you. That creates high emotional engagement. Secondly, application when learning is much better than being passive. Everyone knows that. This is again echoed in VR through immersion. You don't have to imagine that you're in a forest. You are in the forest. You don't have to imagine that you're in the boardroom. You are in the boardroom. That brings people to get uh, closer to real play rather than role play, right? You are being yourself. Thirdly, adaptive practice that the learning adapts to you is important. In VR, this is reinforced by possibility for exploration. You are interacting with virtual characters. They have no feelings, they hear 24 seven, you can't hurt them, and they have no judgment either. And that creates psychological safety. No one is here to judge you, you can do it on your own. And finally, and I'll explain how that works, VR brings about new ways to do self-reflection and to get behavioral data from your performance in virtual reality. And those two reinforce each other, building the feeling of self-efficacy. So how does that work? Um, what we did is we created a set of activities in VR and we have a lot of simulations. And every simulation is built around the same activities like Lego blocks. So the one you can see here is around uh, gender inclusion. And in the first activity, you're observing two characters, Sam and Sophie working together on a project. And your task is to click on the trigger of the controller every time you feel that Sam is being inappropriate. So in that image, I just clicked because he interrupted Sophie. But maybe I missed when well, two seconds later, he had an excluding body language. At the end of that sequence, I'm going to, um, I'm going to have a results panel that tells me the behaviors I noticed, the ones I missed. And I can revisit those specific moments, like a replay in football, but I'm going to revisit them from Sophie's perspective, with Sam looking at me right in the eye. Then you move into the conversation. So Sophie is left very upset. I'm now face to face with Sam, and I have to make the right choices to prompt him to reflect on his behavior. So I can read an option out loud. If I say, hey, Sam, I think what you said to Sophie was unfair, he's going to be defensive, and we're going nowhere. If I say, oh, how do you think this went? Well, I might be opening a conversation. So every time we get feedback, and again, that's psychological safety, right? I'm not role playing. Sam is not real. So I can, I'm encouraged to try new stuff. When it becomes very interesting is after that, it's the intervention. So Sam right now has reluctantly admitted that maybe he was a bit harsh. So I'm given a new task, which is to tell Sam, give him examples of what he did that was wrong. Illustrate the objective impact that his behavior had on Sophie. And finally tell him what I expect from him moving forward. So I'm gonna to try to share a video uh, and Samantha, because I can see you on the thumbnail. If, that, if you have a sound, raise your, your thumb. If you don't, uh, put it down. So, Hey, Sam. So I observed your interaction with Sophie for five minutes. And I heard many things that were patronizing and minimizing. Even your body language was blocking her up. You implied that she wasn't working. And the reason why you implied that is because she's working. And that is sexy. So I'm going to pause here because it's all jittery because it was recorded in VR. But right now, I'm not, I'm not clicking anything. I'm not selecting A, B, or C. I'm not reading. I'm being myself. And that's very difficult. Hence why I'm not giving you the full intervention because I'm not very proud of it. But at the end of that, I'm going to body swap. So you have to remember, my voice was recorded. My body language was recorded as well. And this enables us to do this. Sam, so I observed your interaction with Sophie for five minutes and I heard many things that were patron. So you get what's happening here. I'm now sitting in Sam's body and I'm relieving what I just said from his perspective. I'm sitting across from myself. I'm viscerally experiencing what it's like to be given feedback by me. And that self-reflection is uniquely possible in virtual reality. We ask everyone who, who's done the, the VR would you change anything to what you said or how you said it? And 100% say yes. And that's out of more than 500 experiences. So the power of self-reflection is strong, but it's not enough. We top this up with, um, with behavioral feedback. So for example, in that case, we're going to give you feedback on whether you use Sam's name, how you did in terms of eye contact, 
what body language you had? Did you use actual examples of what he said to Sophie? Were you able to paint an objective picture of the situation, etc.? So that's the that's the the uh, the idea behind the um, behind the behind the framework. So what's what are the results? The vast majority of people have a new sense of awareness in their own skills. Not you know I remember acronyms. No, I know where I am and where I'm going. The vast majority, eighty five percent, have confidence to apply those skills in the real world, which is obviously the holy grail for VR. And finally, the recommendation rate is. Um, is very high. So what does it mean for coaching? Well, as I said, it's about bringing VR into coaching. So VR is not going to replace coaching, of course. It brings applied skills practice exercises in the session. And this is complemented by the personalized, consultative, open-ended action of the coach, which can happen on Zoom and which can be complemented by either. So there's this idea of collaborative intelligence. The human intelligence working hand in hand with artificial intelligence and the data you get and the situations you can create to build new continuous learning journeys. And in details, we've seen our clients use it in two ways. Facilitated, so VR is part of the session. We chat, we have the, the VR experience, you come back and have a debrief or peer learning session, or it's been used as homework. So in between sessions with a coach, the learners would be asked to try something at home in their own time and then come back to, to speak about it. And so I want to leave you with just one idea, um, which is that with VR, you now have what is essentially a flight simulator for interpersonal skills. Coaching is about, it's not about having the right answers, of course. It's about raising one's awareness about their skills and their potential and how to get there. Similarly, flight simulators allow pilots to practice the unexpected in safe ways, to land without uh, any, any casualties. And so as coaches, you now have a tool that can allow you to bring into the session things that you could not do otherwise in the session, or that would be too dangerous to try out in the real world. You can stimulate conversation, you can build self-awareness and build that confidence to unlock the potential that people deserve to unlock and to do that faster. So that's it for me today. Details are here. If you want to learn more, you can scan the QR code if you want to demo. And otherwise, um, add me on LinkedIn. Thanks, everyone. Merci beaucoup, Christophe.